Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 30. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante here extracting the signal. I'm in Boston area with Dave in his studio. We're doing this pod from here. I've been traveling, man, it's been a whirlwind. We've been on an event, SaaS event in Vegas. That's when the MGM hack, we're going to get into that later. Mandian event, CrowdStrike, a slew of events, big acquisitions, Cisco buying Splunk, which we've been to every dot com since its existence, except for the past year. Obviously, they were cutting back. A lot of hot takes on there. Some good rants coming on. David Portnoy with a One Bite Pizza reviews and the Washington Post journalism scandal. That's going to be my rant. And obviously, Intel had a big innovation event or lack thereof. Microsoft Surface Copilot news going head to head against Google. You're starting to see Dave, Microsoft, and Google going at it. And a slew of other news. Obviously, Cisco is the top news. CrowdStrike event, Security Week with Mandian and CrowdStrike, two of the best threat detection companies on the in the world had events the same week we were at both i was with mandian in washington dc david crowdstrike big time conversations going mainstream around cyber warfare chinese being number one apex predator if you will and hacking uh, obviously crowdstrike and mandian make some great content coming out of that and then obviously just more hacks the ai train is continuing to roll along we'll, we'll update you on that there's a lot of new data there dave just a ton of ton of enterprise news. I mean, the enterprise is hot. It's going mainstream. Pod thirty. Here we go. But last day of summer, too. By the way, you, know, <laughs> you can feel it out there in New England. Yeah. I had a little chilly. I put my hoodie on today. Good, looking good with the tie too. Well, I got to do a couple of things this afternoon. <laughs> Breaking analysis day, right? This is my vibe. <laughs> what do you think? I well, mean, we had a pretty killer run with Cube gigs. Um, and a lot of events we didn't get to because we were so busy. And then the MGM hack versus Caesar. Caesars got hacked, MGM decided not to pay, Caesars paid, so there was a huge cybersecurity, pay or don't pay. So it was interesting, and Johnson. Big conversation. Last week we were out at an MGM property, which was uh, the Aria, Yep. right? And it was a shit show coming in. Remember they had, a, they had you know, mm -hmm. they had to write down our credit card <laughs> number. I was like, what are you doing with that piece of paper? Well, we, we got to manually enter it and then we'll shred it, a manager will shred it. I'm like, well, in the meantime, can you please flip it over so nobody can take a picture of my credit card? They're like, oh yeah, sure. So that was kind of a nightmare. So I was at Caesars this week, uh, staying at Bellagio, which is a Caesars property, and the event, the CrowdStrike event was at Caesars, no problem. I mean, there were no signs. And you're saying that Caesars paid the ransom. Yeah, right? paid like, 15 million. Well, 15 million. Boom. Which is, which is interesting, Low. and MGM didn't, so maybe they're still struggling. But the interesting thing is when I drove in the other, you know, two weeks ago for the SAS Explore conference, MGM, you probably saw it too, maybe you were there during the day, but it was pitch black. The, the big lion, the green, black, yeah. which is crazy. I've never seen that before. Yeah, so, a ton of properties were affected, Bellagio. You know, they're all part of the, I see MGM owns all those casinos. I gotta, I gotta tell you, it's amazing to me, John, how packed Caesars and Bellagio were. And I was I went over to Oracle Cloud World one night to have dinner with uh, Juan Loiza from Oracle at uh, the Canaletto. We hang out at Canaletto a lot. You know? <laughs> like, oh, I've never been here before. This is in Ilfranio. They didn't even know that. Yeah. But um, but but th that was pretty packed too. But I could not believe how many people there were in Vegas. So, you know, what, what recession? I mean, <laughs> I, the whole hack thing was interesting is that after that hack happened, it was going on for 10 days before they, now they're back to normal as of today, almost 10 days later. What's interesting is you and I both at Mandian and CrowdStrike, where all the experts were there. And so I had a chance, you were at CrowdStrike, I was at Mandian, and the experts all told me the inside baseball on that. Yeah, did you hear the, the social engineering? All social engineering, help desk, English speaking, Reset my password. Abomination, oh. though. Yeah, I mean. I mean, to basically say, hey, I, I <laughs> call up the help desk to get a password? The fake, I, I mean, wow, that guy's obviously got fired. Yeah. I mean, well, social engineering, they worked their target for a long time, but here's the thing. In cybersecurity world, where the, the warfare's been going on, it's well documented that everyone does these pen tests, and they do SOC reviews. The SOC, the Security Operations Center, is becoming less important because the hackers are going to zero day exploits and actually social engineering, which has nothing to do with pen testing or anything else. Security is getting almost good enough now where it's social engineering is almost a guarantee to be hit. And so social engineering basically means they identify, they learn about you on LinkedIn, maybe TikTok or whatever. They understand who you are, get inside your head, go through your trash, your digital trash or whatever, and then they pretend they're you and they get credentialed in, so there's no malware, nothing. 
they're living off the land, yeah, as no the expression files. goes. So no social, files. It's a fileless hack. You look like an actual person. So that's huge. So social engineering is the new art, state of the art, uh, cybersecurity. And, and by the way, to defend against social engineering, you don't need to be a technical person. This now it's changed so much. Okay, that was one. But big this was a failure in process. Total right? process. The fact that you could just get call up and get your password. But but the SOC analyst experience is like it's like air traffic controllers. You know, they're sitting all day. They burn out fast. They're very short life cycle. So that SOC analyst experience has to improve. And that was one of the big things at CrowdStrike was they had this thing called Charlotte AI, which was basically a natural language interface to dramatically improve the SOC analyst experience. Something not a lot of people talk about this. We have you scale on from Forrester, Ali Mellon, yeah. who covers that. She was actually really good. We can maybe talk about that. But that's interesting. You're saying, like, the SOC's not going away. Is that, that's, is that what you're saying? I'm saying that the SOC is less relevant than it was before for two reasons. One is more zero-day exploits are being leveraged, okay? So that's up and to the right in terms of action. Kind of implies that the SOC's kind of working because they have to go to zero days well, and exactly. social engineering. So that's happening, so social engineering as well. So that puts that in. The second reason why SOCs are under pressure is that some of the technology is like the old, older, antiquated, a little bit outdated. So you've got refresh issues operationally, uh, and then things are changing in terms of the data model and whatnot. So that's kind of a big factor. The tech being used, we had one guy, former Gartner analyst, Antoine, who works now at Mandian, he called it technology from the 90s. A little bit over the top, but but but, but, but but not really that far off. But but here's the thing about the zero day. So it used to be the joke used to be the, the really sad joke used to be because Microsoft has Patch Tuesday, so Patch Tuesday would mean Hack Wednesday. <laughs> but now Patch Tuesday, because everything's compressed speed, means Patch uh, P Patch Tuesday means zero day Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So the stat that was really most telling from CrowdStrike was breakout time. So breakout time used to be an hour and 58 minutes. Last year it went down to 79 minutes this, this year. And the fastest breakout time was seven minutes. Breakout time meaning the time it takes to grab and, and you know, break in, grab the cache and go, or grab, you know, ex, exfiltrate and go, or, or, or encrypt. So that, imagine seven minutes. And that's the, the fastest they've seen, but still 79 minutes. So. So that the point being, it used to be dwell time. Well, it takes 200 days to find people. Well, let's compress that down to 100 days or 10 yeah. days. It doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one thing I heard as well, and that was called the smash and grabs. Yeah. Those are smash and grabs where breakout time is critical. The other one that came out was the dwell time of wandering around, finding the jewels. So they come in on, on a scene, and this came up a lot around shared responsibility model that's been talked about in the industry. So everyone shares, everyone takes the responsibility of their platform. But shared responsibility means you're, you're sistering things up against each other. So that seems, and those seams can be exploited, whether it's zero day or social engineering. Like so Kelsey in the scene. Once you're in, yeah, once you're in the network, you can move around and find the jewels. And, and so what we've been hearing is lateral movement and patterns around lateral movement is they now look at that, that layer two defense, they call it. But if so, you're in and out in 79 minutes, then, then dwell, yeah. time, dwell time becomes the kind of an irrelevant metric. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, but I do think the SOC analyst, the experience is going to, to shift toward using AI to do prioritization and identify the right patch and, and, and actually create workflows, either templatized workflows or custom workflows to fix well, the problem, to well, fix the, pro the exposure. Well, one of the problems about dwell time now, in addition to what you just said, is that dwell time is relevant for another use case of how far back do you need to look at the breach, where the storage is, what much data you got to go through. So again, this is putting just tons of pressure on the CISO. I mean, if you have a dwell time where you can't identify the dwell time, that means you don't know how long the, they've screwed you over, which changes the compliance and reporting breach issues. So that's another factor that kind of comes into the whole uh, data reporting compliance. So that's huge. But issue. that's another one where Gen AI can help a lot. Because I was just going to say that. Yeah, yeah, the reports, just, you know, it's like yeah. the, the cop who doesn't want to do the report, right? Just have Gen AI do the report. That, that was, I was, you just basically <laughs> stole the words right out of my mouth. So that came out big because um, uh, at Mandy, Frank Mandia, who's the, uh, the CEO, um, he basically said he used to spend all his time doing the reports. So the legal work is Kevin so, Mandia. I mean, Kevin Mandia is, uh, meant, the legal work is so freaking hard. It's a heavy lift, time consuming, 
that AI is going to solve that problem. So that's that's where AI's help. The area that I I learned last week from the Mandian thing that was to me is I was so pumped up and drunk on AI around how AI can help security that I I didn't give it a lot of thought about how to secure AI. So these guys are looking at it from both sides of the coin. Are you securing the AI itself, like LLM injections, they're calling it, prompt injections, they're calling it, to how AI works for the practitioners and helps the defenders. So why I, when I asked the, everyone on the cube that I told them you did a poll on Twitter, does AI help the defenders or yeah. attackers? And the mm -hmm. attackers kind of won. Kevin Mandian said, it definitely helps the defenders. And his reasoning was- In, I, in the near term or long term? In long term. Near term and long term. And he said, and the reason is, and I asked him, like, well, that's not what the, the, the poll said. All the vendors yeah, yeah, yeah. said defender. Right. So he actually had a good answer. He didn't just have the vendor position. He said, the asymmetry of the attackers who are sitting here, once they fire off the attack, all the action happens on the, on the, on the defense side. So once there's impact, all the shit happens on the defense side. So he goes, the asymmetry will be taken down by the AI. So the defenders will get a bump up in productivity here. Now, yeah, the attackers will get productive, but they're already productive. The net gain is going to be on to lower the asymmetry between the attacker and the defense. So here's what, so that to me is the, the first honest answer I've ever heard from a vendor. Because I think when, when the instant answer is, oh, it's going to help the, the, the attackers, you better pay us. <laughs> you know? I think that's so self-serving. But here's why I actually agree with, with, with Mandia. It's because of what I saw at CrowdStrike. So George Kurtz, CEO of CrowdStrike, stood up. They demoed this at Black Hat. They, when they announced it, and it was a, a live demo, an actual real demo. Of course, it had previously been done, but it was done on live data. This thing called Charlotte AI, here's George, George Kurtz talking to, now of course, this was all text-based, but they translated it into you know, voice. And she, of course, she had the British accent mm -hmm. and everything else. But he basically said, he, okay, you, you SOC analyst comes in, give me all the, the threats that are the most prominent threats today. And Charlotte AI tells you what those threats are. Then he says, okay, scan my environment and tell me where my exposures are. Boom, okay, tell me the scripts or you know, workflows I need to fix those, boom. All happening in like, near real time. So that's why I do, and so, so here I am thinking, wow, if I'm an attacker, I want to get a hold of Charlotte AI. So I asked CrowdStrike about that, and they said, look, we spent a lot of time trying to keep our tech out of the hands of hackers, but hackers do get it. But we watched them, and we, 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 we actually sometimes bait them into their playbook and then we shut it right down. Yeah. And so there's an example of using AI where the defenders are actually going to get better. And to your point, it's going to make the SOC analyst and the defenders more productive so they're not running around, you know, plugging holes in the dam. The, the, the total changeover is happening. I think, you know, we'll get to the Cisco acquisition in a second around how mm. observability has changed since the cloud era start scaling. I think the same thing's happening with security. And the final thing that I was most excited about with the Mandine event and CrowdStrike event that you were at was, you know, I've been ranting for almost eight straight years on theCUBE about cyber warfare, how we're under attack. There's no holding back right now. They're absolutely saying publicly in out loud that China is the number one threat by multiple factors. They would know. And, and no. they call them the apex attacker that they are so advanced. Russia dropped down to number two, Korea, North Korea is number three. Iran. And Iran, so North Korea's got better mojo on cybersecurity and social engineering. But Russia was interesting, the Ukraine war has had an impact on Russia because one, they, people are leaving the country of Russia, and two, Ukraine used to be the test kitchen for Russia, and also they forks the talent. The Petri dish, And yeah. they want, they're working on the war. So uh, the Russia is kind of distracted right now, so China is clearly number one in the world and this general awareness around doctrine in the United States, how to do it. And Kevin Mandia was saying some of the things you were saying, which is they're learning how to counter offense and that they're going to start holding these people accountable. And so as the companies get smarter on the threat intelligent landscape, the AI and other systems like SOX and AI, so you get the SOC as DevSecOps, that's operational, you know, stuff. 
threat detection is a whole nother ball game. That's what Mandiant was really good at, and they don't have a, an SMB market there. The, they're the top of the pyramid. If, if, so yeah, when something goes wrong, you call Mandiant. Mandiant I mean, is right there. Yeah. CrowdStrike and Mandiant are the, are the two tops. I mean, well, but, but CrowdStrike a product company, you know, Mandiant really is sort of the services play. But like when, when you get hacked, I mean, they're the gold standard of who you call. But I'll tell you one thing, you know, we talk about the ransom. You said Caesar paid the ransom, yeah. right? One, one question you never want to have to ask <laughs> is, should we pay the ransom? Because if you're asking that question, you're basically fucked. But, well, that's a debate. But, pay or not pay, but, that's but simply... He, but here, so here's the thing. First of all, you might not get your data back anyway, but obviously in the case of Caesar's, it probably helped. And people will say, well, it took us a few tries to get the data back. And the second thing is, it's actually illegal to pay co countries like North Korea. You know, if the attacker is in North Korea, you can't pay them. So the FBI is always going to tell you, don't, don't pay. So the point is, you don't want to have to get to that point. So you're better off, one of the guys at CrowdStrike said to us, you know, I guarantee for, for less than $15 million, which was the ransom the Caesar had to pay, I could have secured the Caesar MGM or whatever it was. So, you know, do the homework now. Yeah, it's interesting. All right, well, let's get into some of the cool... Um, news around Cisco. This is what, the one big... of the things I want to just say on Charlotte AI, because I do think they're ahead of it. They announced pricing, and their pricing is $20 per endpoint a year. Now, I know that adds up, but basically Microsoft, for its open AI stuff, its co-pilot is charging $30 per user per month. So this is $20 per endpoint per year. So they're making it pretty inexpensive uh, to, to, to do this, and so I think I think this is going to be a game changer in security. Yeah, and, and, and the edge came up too, by the way, a lot in the edge. At layer two, layer two defense. I mean, the big messages were layer two defense. AI is going to give the advantage to the defender and avoid, help with burnout issue you mentioned. And third is the private-public partnership. Um, the industry believes that the regulation conversation is BS and that the private industries have to lead the defense of our country. And that's going to be very interesting to see. I hope they're right but the government does have to kind of enable that. So we can maybe say that for our rant, rant, rant section. Oh, I got a rant. So <laughs> I do too on that one. Can't wait for cyber, more cyber war rants. But Cisco, Dave, Cisco bought Splunk for $28 billion. We got a ton of analysis here on the Cube. Um, we got questions that we put together as a, as a team. Um, there's gonna be a ton to unpack here, but Splunk, the leader in probably one of the most epic startups, in my opinion, that solved the problem extremely well, a problem that nobody wanted to solve, and created a public company, grew the hell out of it, we covered it, log data, okay, yeah. as, the, as the internet grew and cloud grew, and more uh, hyper-converged infrastructure, uh, software-led infrastructure grew, the need to go through log files was something that they built, and it's just been just a, a, a gift that keeps giving from a revenue standpoint, and amazing company, and then boom, Amazon Cloud comes out. So Jeremy Burton had a great analysis on this, but you know, Splunk has been a walking dead company for what, two years, three years now? Maybe yeah, two years for sure. Even even, even four years, I'd say pre-pandemic even, they started to decline pretty, I'd say 2019 is when we first, with the ETR data, Eric Bradley and myself, in fact, I think in 2019 we predicted bad things ahead for Splunk, yeah. and um, but so, but it's but, almost it's almost a marker, Dave. Like when companies don't invite the cube back, they're cutting budgets down so bad. Events get smaller. You know, you know it's like oh, yep, yeah, recession. Well, you know, it's a little funny. Red I was going to say. So you remember the three, what, so three of the hottest companies when we started the cube? It was Splunk, Tableau, and ServiceNow, and all three of those companies, you know, rocketed. And then you know, Tableau was you know client based, and they had to transition yeah. to the cloud, so they brought in. Adam Salipsky to clean that up, and then of course they got acquired. Service now, you know, kept rocking even after Slootman left, um, and and John Donahoe was sort of the interim guy in between. And then now, of course, you know, S, former SAP CEO Bill yeah. McDermott is kicking ass over there. Um, and, and and but Splunk, we've been to how many dot coms have we been to, John? And you know, as since well as 2012, I do. every single event you, up you, until 2020. You know, you know as well as I do. Extremely loyal customer bases. They got the yeah. guys with the funny hats and the VFW <laughs> hats running around, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Um, and and they're, they have an awesome customer base. There's a lot of criticism about pricing, you know, Splunk kind of being the oracle of, you know, log metrics and so forth. And <laughs> Data movement also. There. And your point about big, big problem with cloud, you know, cloud came in and they didn't really have a great cloud strategy. And the second thing was they had to transition to ARR. 
and that was painful. It always yeah. is painful, and they didn't do such a great job of it. Then they bought Signal FX under when Doug Merritt was there. That helped a little bit. But what, so what happened is we started to see the decline in around 2019, particularly in you know, 2020, even though you know, the bubble helped their stock price, but you could see from a spending standpoint, they were, there was icebergs ahead. So they bring in Steele, Gary Steele, to help clean it up. That was, he came from Proofpoint. He's a private equity cleaner. He's like that guy in Pulp Fiction. Wolf comes in, cleans, <laughs> up, sure, Wolf. cleans up the dead body. Um, hey man, why don't you say yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> Splunk was a great company, great culture. I've always respected. I've always respected the, the culture of Splunk because they, when Doug Merritt was there, when they had their growth, he, they created a culture of innovation, um, camaraderie, fun. Um, the people were all awesome. And then when Knives came out, when it got tight, when the budget started squeezing. I just think the board of directors just went to hell in the handbasket. I talked to Doug Merritt about it privately, and he won't say anything. But you know, reading between the lines with Doug Merritt, he had this great company, and he basically he didn't say he got forced out, but he left abruptly, which is a sign that mm -hmm. there's bad board behavior. And we know that they tried to hire two Amazonians, Teresa Carlser and Sean uh, Bice, uh, who's now, Sean Bice has now worked for Charlie Bell at Microsoft, and so there was a huge board dynamic at that time. That was clearly, in my opinion, a symptom of the fact that Splunk reign was over. The reign of their greatness was over. Uh, Cloud was, was there. They're, they had competition. Uh, Clint Sharp, who's founder of Cribble, he used to talk to me about the pricing. I think he built the product. He sold to Splunk. Um, there's been a lot of Splunk killers coming out. Um, people were eating away at their data, but they were just, they're like VMware. They had a product that people love, Dave. Well, Datadog okay. was one of those those Splunk uh, and you know, attackers. They still got Datadog, that great product. And Elastic was another one. And 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 so the rumor was that Cisco, and Cisco's been rumored to buying Splunk for like a year now, <laughs> but there was also a rumor they were going to buy Datadog. But they would have had to pay more for Datadog. Now, Datadog has, has better growth well, we'll, and certainly better Well, let's get, let's get into this Jeremy Burton analysis. Jeremy Burton, the founder of Observe, uh, former VMC executive and CMO. Uh, he's, a, he's the founder of Observe, which is funded by the Snowflake guys. So he's kind of tied into the whole future. First of all, Cisco's going to do very well with Splunk because when you have a dead dead company that moves over, that's a cash cow. That's going to yeah, increase over. That it's going to it's going to increase the base. What the logic is there? So you want to go there first? Well, I think it's relevant, right? So yeah, why okay. does Cisco buy Slunk, Splunk, right? So cash cow. So they get $4 billion in ARR. Cisco's got like 40% of its revenue now is coming from software subscriptions, yeah. which is huge. And Splunk, you pointed this out to me yesterday, we heard it on the, on the call, only a third of the Splunk's revenue is overseas. And yes. Cisco's got a massive overseas business. <laughs> they're going to make they're this thing, kill they're going to kill it. It's they're going to kill it. a great move for Cisco. And 28 yeah. billion, that's yeah. one of the, I think their biggest acquisition ever, but you know, whatever, they got 28 billion in cash. I mean, it's a dog with fleas on standalone basis. This is what company, how I would describe Splunk as the way they were dying. Cisco's brilliant moves to bring that in, clean that up quickly, I'm sure that Gary Steele, because remember, they made an offer overture a year ago was reported, we reported that, so did the Wall Street Journal, that rumor, um, clean, probably cleaned up the product Clean portfolio. it up, we'll buy it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Do the journey work. Come, come back with a better proposal. Right. <laughs> the, the price is still the same. And Cisco's going to, one, get the cash, have a better data story with AppD and Thousand Eyes, right? Yep. So they got Thousand Eyes, great synergies. Um, and it gives them more mojo with the data and the AI play in cyber and as well. Yeah, and with G2's and, business. And, and G2, Tom, so the check, 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 check all the boxes, culture fit, check. Um, and then the international. Home run, boom, boom, big company takes it. And this is what Jeremy Burton was basically saying. Oh, wait, wait, before you go there. So the big thing for Cisco, John, is going to be how they integrate it. You, Zeus, and I talked about this at Cisco Live, is, you know, they're, they're, we talked about the complexity, they're taming complexity, how they're doing that, but they, so Liz Santoni, right, she runs the observability business, G2 Patel runs the security business. It looks like they're keeping Gary Steele around, I'm sure yeah. to do the integration, he's going to be responsible for that, but then what do they do with that asset? Do they break it up? Do they put it into the different divisions? Do they bring it all under one executive? That's where Cisco really has to make some tough decisions and, yeah. and actually integrate this time. That's what they're criticized for a lot, is not doing that integration. And not doing I kind of sensed on the call with Chuck Robbins, the way he was talking, um, that he kind of had, he wanted to say more there, but he wanted to yield to Gary Steele more. And I think the way I'm reading your point there is that two things came on that call that were kind of in between the lines. They talked about TAN expansion and growth. 
Yeah. But there really is no growth to Splunk. It's accretive synergy from Cisco. The international piece could growth grow. from an in, once yeah. they get it into Cisco. So Cisco. Oh yes. As an as a, just a machine will grow the Whereas number. Whereas Datadog would have been a, a not a, market would growth have been per se. It's, yeah. it's the combination right. of what Splunk brings to the table. That's the synergy piece. That's the growth. And this comes back down to the observability market. I think the analysis that's missing that was missed on the on the on the day of the acquisition is everyone's talking about observability. To me, this has nothing to do with observability for Cisco other than the fact that they have observability play that they're going to bring in. And so Cisco made a great call here to take a big piece off the table, gives them the numbers on the software and the reach, data and, and the things, data makes things more predictive, yeah. right? Versus reactive. Now that is a home run. Now, good call. I think that analysis will stand the test of time. We'll go back at the podcast. We'll look at it. I'm sure we'll be great on that as well. Let's get into the Jeremy Burton piece. Jeremy Burton, founder Observe. An observability startup. Remember, we when we were commenting on observability day, we said crowded field. It's going to consolidate. It's going to be a startup. But you know, we said once there's a tailwind, uh, turns to a headwind. It's going to be a shit show. So he got the best name if that name sticks. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Jeremy was is on the board of Snowflake, so he's got some insight into this. Plus, he's a senior executive in the industry. So, so and it's first time doing a startup, by the way. So it's interesting to see Jeremy be on you know the big executive suite, but now a founder. So. And fun, fun to always talk to Jeremy. So he sent me a document. He draws a line in the document from 2000 to 2024. And then there's a set of companies that were founded going back to 2000 Splunk, Dynatrace, New Relic, AppDynamics, SumoLogic, Datadog, Elastic, founded in 2012. That's the demarcation line. He calls the Amazon boundary, right? Amazon since 2012 really kind of changed the next gen cloud services. We saw the VMs go to go to Kubernetes, You're seeing a whole other set of microservices. On the other side of that line, you got 2013-14, Signal FX, Grafana Labs, Lightstep, Axiom, Honeycomb IO, Observe, his company, Chronosphere, and Signos. Okay. We've interviewed every one of those companies except Axiom. So we know all of those companies. Splunk, gone. Dynatrace. Great company still around, probably will hang around. New Relic, private equity, App Dynamics, Cisco, Sumo Logic. I think they went private equity, didn't they? And Datadog's yeah. still public. Elastic, maybe on the bubble. We'll see. If you don't sell to a private equity company, you have to get a big dog to pick you up. And so I'll quote Jeremy Burton's line here. He says, All the companies on the left, only one or two might make it. The price of failure acquisition is an acquisition by a strategic acquirer, big tech company like Cisco or a private equity player. In both cases, once they acquire the acquisition, it's used to fuel their customer base and associated cash flow. As a technology proposition, they are for all intended purposes dead. I, I think that's the most accurate statement because it's an integration play to your point and then synergies, which Cisco I think nailed it. So that leaves the, 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 the music stop, musical chairs is happening. So Dynatrace, Datadog, Elastic, left there. On the other side, you got the new the new company. So, I mean, I think I he's mean, got a good read on if, this. If I'm Jeremy and I'm into crowded space, I love the fact that there's M&A there and I love the fact that it's Cisco because let's face it, Cisco is going to work really well within Cisco. But that leave, there's a whole big market there outside of Cisco. So that's, that's goodness for a company like uh, uh, Observe, even though we're very positive from Cisco's standpoint of the Splunk acquisition. But, there's still more shoes that have to drop in that space because it's it's it is really crowded. But it's so the it's question growing. the question to ask after that, if you believe that, which we just laid out a good case for, I think Jeremy nailed it. The next question is, who wins on the right side? So, and he, and he, and he puts out there that the survivors will have to have growth and earn the right to fight for the big prize. So that's a, the winners on the left are going to have to get acquired, but the ones on the right have to get the growth. And that's going to be the question for the observability, Dave. And and our, our, our looking at the data models that are out there, the, the Uber post you did, how real-time data, I think that that right side of observability is going to turn into data platform companies. And, and finding the growth wave will be very interesting. Where did he have Datadog in that little model? He had Datadog on the left side. It was just kind of legacy. Which is founded in 20, 2010 yeah. uh, or 2009. Dynatrace is even earlier. They've been around longer. New Relic, AppDynamics, they're gone. Or New Relic was So I don't know. I mean, Datadog to me is interesting because they are, you know, they, they do have some momentum, but, but, but they, you know, they, they grew bottoms up. So I think they crossed they, the line, they, they, even though they were founded in 2010, 
on that side yeah, of the I line. Do, I do think they they've did been blowing the it out since 2014. They, they, did, they do have a bit of a go-to-market shit show based on my sources, but, but that can be corrected. Yeah, Data Dog. Data Dog might be a little bit long in the tooth. We'll see. I mean, you know, we don't really engage with them much, so um, we should we should reach out to them. Yeah, I mean, I just I know from some salespeople who work there and who have worked there, it was kind of a, a, a cluster F. Uh, What's but, the, what do you think the bottom line with Splunk and Cisco? What's going to be, what, what, what do you think we'll have to, what are the questions um, that we would ask? What uh, you would, as we get into Cisco, who runs the team? Is yeah, it J2 first, or Liz Sloney? First of all, the thing's complicated. You know, it's a pretty big acquisition. So it's going to take nine to 12 months to actually you know, close the deal. And then how do they organize? So w once, they, once they close the deal, then it's going to take them another year to do the integration. How will they do that integration where do the different assets go? Where are their synergies? Where are their product overlaps? One of the analysts on the call, financial analyst, was like, yeah, I got some product overlap. But like, no, no, there's no product overlap. There is some product overlap. We know that. Okay, so the Cisco's pattern has, has been to just let, the, let the, the asset stand alone and prove itself. I don't think that's the right play here for customers. I think they want to actually come to customers with, 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 a, with an integration plan. Yeah. That's going to take them a year to figure that out. And then where does it go in Cisco's organization? You know, we know I, I thought the, the our internal analyst meeting we had yesterday that, that you put together was really solid. Rob Stretch and you put together some good comments. But the, the questions that came out of my notes there were my concerns were one, customer concerns, possible customer concerns with the Cisco deal is, will it be higher prices? Yep. Dilution on innovation. Yeah, dead company has that synergy happen. Splunk's brain drain, interesting yep. piece there. Like do the great yeah, will people there be a brain drain? And brain, then brain focus, drain. right? Like where's the focus? How much do they trim? What do they tweak? This is the some of the same questions that's going on at VMware Broadcom. Product overlap, you mentioned that. I lock I, in, I, lock in and, and choice. If I'm a Splunk customer, like Broadcom's thinking about VMware, if you've got vSphere, you can't go anywhere else. So the art of the of the deal, in my opinion, here is for Splunk and Cisco to be like, Let's keep that core base and get them turning on more Splunk things or more Cisco yeah. things. Is Thousand Eyes better with this? I'd imagine it is. Is AppD better with this? I'm sure it would be. So I think if I'm an architect or I'm an executive at Cisco, I'm probably going, okay, how do I bring in, keep the cash flow going, grow the international, check, check, check. How can I get more revenue on the, on the synergies? That's going to be... My number one question when we were in the analyst calls with these guys, and then keep raising my hand on the, that one the other, How about the analyst who asked, why, why'd you buy a legacy company? Why didn't you buy a hot firm? Oppenheimer, I love that guy. Right? He was, <laughs> <laughs> he like, he, uh, and, and so, but the answer was- Well, that's was, what Jeremy Burton's basically saying. Right, right. right. Yeah. But, but the answer was, hey, Splunk's got a really good hybrid multi-cloud strategy. That's what our customers want. We're meeting them where they are. I, I do think that's valid, by the way. I mean, if I'm Cisco and I don't have a cloud, that's one of the other questions that came up, John, in our internal yeah. meeting, right? Was, what, what do you think about, you know, what's, what do you think about Splunk's cloud strategy, which we're going to, you know, go out to the field and ask. We think Splunk missed the boat on cloud, or we see Splunk's hybrid multi-cloud strategy is really attractive and meeting our needs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the kinds of things that we're going to pick at with customers, with our partners at ETR and our own survey work, and we'll come back and report on that. Well, what's interesting is, is with all the AI stuff, a lot of on-premises swinging back. So data, they, the data piece is going to be a lot of on-prem protecting AI, and that's going to be interesting. And that's what cybersecurity, I think is a big angle on that. I think the security angles in the Cisco deal, to me, is a big upshot for this thing. If J2, G2 Patel takes this on, this instantly changes his world. Right, because he can then go and increase his numbers that you 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 pointed out at the last Cisco Live. He's yeah, yeah. that's an opportunity for Cisco from a revenue standpoint. And I think they have a four billion dollar security business that's not growing. Now they take the Splunk asset and they start, you know, really integrating that product in on the security side and driving those those international sales and other Cisco uh, synergies, bringing it together with network, because networks network and security go hand in hand, they could get that yeah. business growing again. Well, we're going to keep on doing that. So, Dave, one thing I want to bring up, we're going to get a lot going on at the rant. We'll get to that rant section soon. But I wanted to bring up something that I saw that got my attention. I've been following Carta. Carta is a company that makes the service for yeah, all the VCs and all their stock certificates. Yeah. Uh, we use them as well. They got good data. 
And they, they have a technology that sees everyone's cap table. Right. <laughs> it's, like, it's almost like a hidden little secret there. It's like a secret sauce. It's like crunch base, but you can take a look inside the cap tables. But they aggregate their data. And here's an interesting report they just put out. Startup compensation, first half of 2023. A major chill on compensation, equity and cash. Okay, um, um, the first half, about 28 billion was raised. Um, less than half was raised in the first quarter. You know, with this economy, their employee compensation's down, Dave. Wait, okay. so wait, are you talking about money raised or comp? No, people's comp. comp. Because of the lack of, of funding well, environment. The, the total comp, the 28 billion? So 28 billion was raised. So look at the cap tables right, and okay. what's the grants look like? So what, uh, so, okay. so the report looks at equity grants and cash compensation. So during the first half. Are there, are there averages or what, what are the, what's the data show? What's the indication that it's down? Okay, so the first half, Startups on Carta collected, collectively hired 314,000 employees. That figure fell, okay, mm -hmm. and the, the first half of 2022, 314,000. Okay. okay. In this year, 129,000. Wow. Okay, that's new hires. The year to date. Year, first half of 2022, Versus, first half of 2023. Okay. Which is this year. So um, salaries flatline to start the year. So total compensation benchmarks for employees' salaries fell 0.3% from November 22 to May 2023. Equity packages saw some substantial reductions. Over November 2022 to May 2023, average equity grants benchmarks declined 26%. Is, is that a value number or a shares number? Equity grants, averages. Do you Average know that? Is, that? is that in terms of value or? Or it's no, it's got to be grants. It's 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 number of yeah, I mean percent of the grants, stock grants, I guess. Um, and then layoffs are no longer rising, but have yet to subsidize so or, or subside. Mm. So um, you know, remember I said in the podcast, startups going falling out of the sky, not so much, but still pain, right? So the question is, um, you know, the headcount has fallen. You know, I think too, it would be a lot worse without AI. <laughs> I mean, it, would be a, it would be a disaster without AI, don't you think? Yeah. This is interesting. Net headcount across Carta companies has fallen for five straight months. Six of the last seven. The exception was January 2023. So, uh, well, startups I'm a, aren't I'm hiring. A, and, and, we, and that's not new information. I'm an LP on you know, some, some of these you know, SaaS, vertical SaaS companies. And every one of them, sort of pre-downturn, had you know, 12 months plus of, of runway, they had 100% plus growth rates. The percent of customers that, that are, or companies that are in that, those categories now is a tiny slice of what it used to be. Yeah. It's all down to you know, under six months, I'll, I'll three send, months. I'll send this to you so you can noodle. I know you love data. So it's austerity measures are definitely in place. I know, I know you love data, so yeah. I'll just send that to you. But again, this, this is a, a headwind market. Um, and even with the AI trend, the other tr uh, thing I saw is that uh, of all the unicorns, San Francisco Bay Area is dominating the unicorns. Um, there was even a clever post uh, saying that Barry's Gym is a, is a, is a, is a new thing involved in, in um, that, that's the hot you know, uh, gym everyone goes to. And if there's a Barry's Gym nearby, there's more unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> so a little tongue in cheek uh, on, on one of those um, um, posts I read about some of the, some of the unicorns. AI is booming in San Francisco. I think it's going to be written and will go down. Um, I think it'll be written and will go down that the summer of 2023 was the summer of AI love. Um, it was definitely a love fest in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and it reminded me of the Web 2.0 days, Dave, where there was so much collaboration and enthusiasm around the, the wave. This one obviously being 10 times better than, bigger than, better than, and then the Web 2.0. But there was that generational you know, rise. And, you know, I started my podcasting company on that wave, you know, early on, and the bloggers were emerging, you know, the tech crunches of the world, the pod techs were emerging. And this is like a hundred X step up in enthusiasm. The meetups are packed. Um, the AI startups are awesome. Um, the people are younger. Um, and the older people like us are feeling younger. It's like a fountain of youth. AI is a fountain of youth. And uh, I, I can't get enough of it. I'm, I can drink the AI Kool-Aid all day long. I love it. Um, and this is great data you just sent me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Going on a tangent here. Uh, on other news, Wall Street Journal had a huge piece on AWS 
Um, they talked about Amazon's search for its next big hit. I thought that was a very interesting story. They went over in the same story of trying to find their fourth pillar. A lot of Andy Jassy conversations. Um, I heard scuttlebutt that they're working on another big story on Andy Jassy. Um, and, uh, well, that's my rant today, by the way. It's AWS FTC. We can save that. Yeah, I mean, well, let's get into it. Let's, uh, let me miss that. Well, my rant, oh, my rant's the Portnoy thing. David Portnoy in the Washington Post. You want to go first? Well, I have two rants, the cybersecurity thing and Portnoy. The Portnoy thing was on Fox News yesterday. I saw that uh, highlight. Fox News took the opportunity to, to jump on that bandwagon to drive their agenda. But ultimately, they were doing a hit piece on him, and he called out the reporter, and the reporter lied to him. And this is causing a riff in the journalism community because the journalists all want to support the, their brethren, in this case a woman, who was saying, hey, you know, she did the right thing, that's how journalism works. And the other half saying, not really, he really kind of lied to him straight up. And even if he was, she was doing a critical piece, you know, you want to get both sides of the story. So you have the journalism community forking between, you know, staying with your teammate, if you will, and others saying that's bad behavior. So, you know, I, the general consensus is, is that the Washington Post independent of their feelings for David Portnoy, who does the best pizza reviews everyone loves, um, they they went after him, and they were just, they treated him very badly. So I thought, you know, I saw it first from Jason Kalkanis, and then, then it just went super viral from there. And so um, it's just gotten so bad. This activist journalism is so poor. You know, I think I'd like to see more balance in, in when you do an article on someone, you should call them up and get an interview. Like, not just research it and then publish it without talking to the person. Well, the, and that's, that, that that's was unbelievable when he, how he baited her into basically her spilling the beans on, well, I basically put that in there just to get a response. That negative, you know, that you're misogynistic. It's a, it's a which tactic. Is a, which is a word he couldn't pronounce, but anyway. I'm sure he did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Misogynistic or whatever. I think, I think that was by design. You think so? Yes, I think he did that on purpose. Because they don't want anyone quoting him and having that voiceover be... You know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. That's a meme waiting to happen. Oh, you're, oh that's clever. Oh, <laughs> Maybe that's just me. But that's what I would do. <laughs> Hell, I got so many bad things I've said on the cube. My memes are going to be all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the other thing I want to tell you about that I did, I did a podcast with Eric Nielsen, who runs community at VMware. Mm. And he's doing this thing called a, um, I call it a victory kind of lap. Now that VMware is closing this chapter down of their historic run and Broadcom is going to buy them by the end of this month, end of October is that he's bringing all the OGs on John Troyer he brought us on and he's doing kind of a throwback podcast so I just he's like did, a hidden legend inside of VMware he's been there I think he's been there one of those guys who's been there long he's got like secret passages he knows all the people um, he's he's one of their OGs and, and it's interesting their, their community might be the crown jewel Dave of VMware and Hawk Tan was rumored to have said to the VMUG owner that community is very very important to them and that it's it's going to keep their base active and enthusiastic for vSphere and upgrading what we've been reporting on the cube as the shelfware because Broadcom as we pointed out on our stories and in our reporting that Broadcom has to get the customers installing more stuff if they don't they can't charge more so I think that's going to probably be the focus going forward with VMware Explore in Barcelona which will be the first event by the way post acquisition so uh, in November, you'll see VMware Explorer. So I thought that was interesting. Um, Do we know that deal is going to close next month? That's the rumor. Yeah. I think people are up in flux. There's going to be a mass layoff coming. So I think people are scared. So I thought I'd throw that out there. All right, that's that's my that's my rant. All right. You want me to go do my rant? Yeah. It's it's back to FTC. Oh, <laughs> <Can't God. help. laughs> okay, so Amazon is basically provided, or FTC provided more information this week on um, its suit against Amazon, they named three new individuals that they're going after. Russell Grandianetti, who was the senior vice, or is the senior vice president of International Consumer. Jamil Ghani, who's the former prime boss, or he is the prime boss. And then Neil Lindsay, who's the senior vice president who used to oversee Prime's tech and operations. They were specifically named. So uh, 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 Grandianetti and Lindsay are part of Jassy's S team, okay? And they're, they're going after uh, Amazon, as you know, for a deceptive Prime pro or, or practices on getting people to sign up for Prime. 
and then have, making it harder for them to cancel, which we've talked about and how it's really not that hard to cancel. But, you know, they probably played some games there, I, I understand. And I would say this, that, okay, tell Amazon to stop. Amazon will stop. They'll make it easier to cancel, which is really easy to cancel Prime, and then move on. Here's my rant. The average credit card interest rate, John, in the United States is 22.75%. But if you're a new customer, you can get in for 20.68%. Okay? This is criminal. The average credit card debt is for an American is just under $8,000. You're talking about, at, at that rate, you know, 20 plus percent, you're talking about $1,700 a year in interest payments. The cost of Prime is $180 a year. Okay, you can't cancel your credit card debt. You can you can f figure out how to cancel your Prime, push a button, and be done with it. One hundred eighty dollars per year. Okay, this is bullshit that the government coming so down so hard on big tech when these banks are just ripping off the American consumer, allowing them to you know raise all this debt. Or, or take on all this debt, take on all this water, particularly when interest rates were zero, and back then they were charging 18%. Why not go after, if you really want to protect the consumer, I mean, this is so disingenuous in my opinion, and it's because, you know, the government's in bed with the bank because it's regulated. You know, you saw yeah. Bill Gurley's, you know, <laughs> talk, which was brilliant at the yeah. All-In Summit, yeah. and he talked about the, the downside of regulation. Now, re regulation, by the way, is not all bad. I'm, I'm glad that there's you know regulation regulation in certain industries, um, for sure. But I mean, this to me is unbelievable that they allow these companies to set up what is it in South Dakota that has no, you know, just basically makes it easy to do whatever you want and charge whatever you want and rip off the 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 consumer. I mean, it's 180 bucks a year for Amazon Prime. Tell them to stop. They'll stop. Make it easy to 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 unsubscribe, which you can do at any time. So that's my rant. I, mean, I think that's a great rant because, I mean, that's just, I mean, talk about regulating banks. I thought they were supposed to be regulated, especially after the 2008 crisis. Um, just horrible. I mean, my, back to my regulation rant on cybersecurity is, um, it came up a lot, is that the whole AI thing went on for a week and a half. All the AI guys went down to D.C., you know, putting on a show. Um, the government doesn't know what to regulate. And I think this whole jumping at Amazon, there's other fish to fry. And I think that's just a political theater an ax to grind on Amazon. What has Amazon done to harm consumers? What's the question? I mean, it's unbelievable I mean, to how me. How am I hurt? How, how is it hurting competition? Um, <laughs> I mean, okay, I guess it's affected retail and the retail business. Some but rogue product like, manager could go, yeah. some rogue product manager could go forward and, and beat someone else mm -hmm. with making toilet paper. Okay, small business may be there. Okay, I get that. Um, but Amazon is not, intentionally in my opinion knowing the culture going out there they are they are focused on making profits and they're so aggressive there's, there's nothing I, wrong know, with that I get but, it. but i mean the, the prices are, are are moderated and down thanks to amazon the service is incredible it, you know they're trustworthy so much more trustworthy than a lot of other online retailers they got competition through the roof with walmart and okay if they're playing some games tell them to stop make yeah. them stop they should stop and they did, by the way. I can I can cancel my when this first came out. I said, "Wow, how hard is it to cancel my Prime subscription?" It took like three clicks. No, nope. yeah. it was so intuitive and so obvious how to cancel. So I presume Amazon, after they came after them, after the FTC came after them, made that yeah. change. Okay, they made the change. I I All think right. I think I mean, I give think them a slap on the wrist and move on. My other my my rant on the regulation is let AI go, let it happen, let it be open. Put some guardrails around it like they did the, the domain name system when the internet started with the computers. Let the web develop, let the internet develop. They did a great job. Department of Commerce handled that perfectly. And then when it got too big, they brought everyone in. ICANN went global. The rest is all history. A little history lesson there, how they handled it. Do not get in and regulate it. Let the private sector do it. So so that's that's my rant. Um, yeah. All right. Well, well, like we said last week, by the way, but getting a bunch of government folks and billionaires who run AI companies in the room to figure this out is oh, yeah, they're, they're, probably not the answer. Well, the, <laughs> the only reason why they're in that room, Dave, and this is the truth, if anyone's going to listen to this podcast, if you've got in the background, listen carefully right now. The only reason why they're in Washington, D.C. is they don't want startups to emerge. 
Okay, they're afraid of the startups and open source. So all those big companies, it's disingenuous to be there and say that it needs to be regulated. It's completely BS. Sam Altman, all those guys, completely disingenuous to the whole purpose. They're afraid of startups. So for them to say, regulate us, that is BS and it's false. Well, and that's not true and they know it. And that's, and so they just want to keep their lead, especially Microsoft and the big guys. Well, when, when industries get regulated, Bill Gurley pointed this out in his brilliant talk, you haven't seen it, um, Google, Bill Gurley, all in Summit 2023. He basically said, look what happens when you regulate. The intent of the regulation is to open up, you know, you know, to open up competition and make sure that it's all fair. And what happens is it kills competition. He's exactly and right. The, I'm with him on that. The incumbents make all the money and, <laughs> and then it basically is dead. And he, the, he told a story, it was a really interesting story in his early days. He was investing in, in communications equipment and he was trying to get, you know, create a standard and, you know, the big cable companies were like, no, 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 we're the standard. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of all in, out of the speaking water. of the all in podcast, just some breaking news here. I see that the, the alternate Brad uh, Gerstner, who runs uh, Alt Capital, uh, Altimeter Capital, he's, a, he's their alternate kind of stand in, just tweeted, um, Chamath is hosting a fundraiser for Vivek, Vivek Ramaswamy next week, featuring a ton of Silicon Valley heavy hitters. The expected event is supposed to bring in a million dollars in for him for a super PAC. Tickets are 50K, Dave. You can be, for 50 plus, you can be in there. Let's just say that- I'm not going. When I'm a billionaire, maybe I'll put up 50K, but like, I'll pass on that one. Well, so Chamath <laughs> is all, he's all, he's all in on, uh, no, you know, pun intended on uh, Vivek. Um, I don't know. He's, he, he likes his, his style. He's got the Indian thing going on with him, which is cool. Um, I don't know. I'm not sold on on Vivek. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm just. I just. I don't. I think I, just. I, I don't want to see a, a Biden Trump rematch. That's what I know right now, and I haven't made any decisions on anything. All else. right. Well, I we definitely have, don't want to see those two going at it. We had amazing. I think the theme this week is Cisco, Dave. Right? Cisco, cyber warfare, cybersecurity. Um, and uh, so a couple other things bad journalism. going on this week. It had the Instacart. Um, IPO. IPO, which was kind of a flop. It's, it basically is back to where it was on day, day zero. Same with ARM, you know, you had an ARM pullback. So, you know, we were hopeful that these things would create some momentum for the market, but you know, everybody's still watching the Fed. And so it's not like IPOs are coming to, going to come roaring back. We said that, I think you asked the question last week in the, in the cube pod or somebody did. Yeah. And our answer was no, no, this is still, <laughs> you know, really some, <laughs> some challenges ahead. Um, Acquisition, there's rumored acquisition of Talon for 600 million by interesting Palo Alto Networks. By the way, Talon, <laughs> CrowdStrike and George Kurtz invested in Talon. They do a secure browser, so that was kind of weird. I was at, I was at the CrowdStrike Falcon conference and there was Talon presenting and you know, had a big presence. George Kurtz was an investor and it looks like Palo Alto's uh, picking him up. So that was kind of interesting. And then Oracle Cloud World was this week. Right, we weren't there. We used to do all the Oracle you, Open. Did worlds. you do a flyby at all? You I did. You I did dinner? a flyby. Had dinner with uh, Juan Loiza and a bunch of other analysts, and uh, which was good to catch up with those guys. But the best thing I saw coming out of Oracle Cloud World was the rant. So it was Q and A. I think analyst Q and A with Larry, and somebody asked him, "What about, what about Snowflake?" I was like, "Oh, beautiful." Remember the time <laughs> yeah. somebody asked him, "What about Workday?" Workday's kissing your, kicking your ass. That journalist that he, I saw that his, he I saw his Snowflake. I mean, you got balls to ask Larry that question because, but it was great. His answer was. Was was uh, he went on for ten minutes, seventeen x faster? Yeah, eviscerating you know. Snowflake, which of course you know it was so much easier than Snowflake. Well, okay, not really, but she was talking about MySQL Heatwave, which is actually a pretty cool product. Yeah, bringing transactions and analytics together. And have you seen the benchmarks? And uh, it was just <laughs> he loved his benchmarks. It was classic, Larry. But it's another again, it's another yeah. indication that that the Snowflake is doing well. You know, he, he and you know, hey, Larry's. I mean, they're the king of database, so you got to respect yeah. them despite in, in sick Ray's snarky comments to me at SuperCloud. Yeah, no, no, I mean, he, when, when he calls out someone, it's definitely on his radar, because getting on his radar is actually a compliment. So yeah. um, the other thing that came out of that, people were, were actually talking about how he still got the balls to, to, and to be that aggressive and compete. The other thing that came out of that, Dave, was the fact that if you look at the compute and GPU markets, that the, the shift to compute and connectivity is happening. So with the edge emerging, the core cloud edge 
uh, distributed computing is going to be the security paradigm, and and it's going to be data 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 driven. And and the question is, is that this there's still going to be more and more databases out? Everyone and their mother's got a vector database. We're expecting more and more announcements coming around vector databases. So that thing is going to consolidate too, because you know we're going to see things. You know, companies are going to just you know, Oracle announced a vector database. Others are going to announce a vector database. So one other thing is Intel at a oh, big at a big yeah. event this week. Um, again, we weren't there, but we watched. And I saw on Twitter, Crawford Del Pret actually put out a tweet, hey, I, the roadmap's looking pretty good. Some, some counted Intel down and out, or something to that effect. And I think he was talking about me. I wish he had called me out specifically because I've been sort of vocal about some of the challenges that Intel. So I said, let's define what down and out actually means. What's the probability that within the next five to seven years, Intel will, will regain number one in foundry and number one in design and be number one overall. And then John Fort chimed in, CNBC, saying, is that really the criterion? Is it really number one or nothing? And the answer that I gave was no, it's not number one or nothing, but what's the probability that Intel is going to be better than number three in foundry within that time frame? And I think it's the probability is, is very, very low. Um, and you know, what does it mean? The f what's the future of Intel look like? They, they're, they're doubling down on the portfolio. They got a big portfolio. Pat made a bunch of announcements, a bunch of AI announcements, but the fundamentals remain the same, that Intel is no longer the volume leader. The ARM ecosystem is the volume leader. Now that doesn't mean go out and invest in ARM because ARM's got its own challenges because so much of the value goes to the ecosystem, but that ecosystem as a whole, that business model has created massive volumes which have conferred huge value outside of Intel. So the, the alternatives, and Intel's fighting an in-front war. They're fighting AMD, they're fighting NVIDIA, they're fighting TSM and Samsung. They're, you know, China is <laughs> coming after them. And so, you know, Pat, as we've said, we love Pat, he's doing everything possible. Yeah, but, I mean, but the, the challenges remain. So I, why, I why, any... is, why are some of those other analysts such cheerleaders? Because they could pay a lot of money by Intel. But, so, but what's their angle? What's their argument? Okay, so their, their angle is, and it's a good one, they're, they're, they're right, and despite the fact that they pay a lot of money, that was kind of a snarky comment by me, but their, their angle is, look, Intel is a leader. They still you know, control the x86 roadmap. Um, they've got a massive install base. They've got a great ecosystem. They've got you know, standards throughout. They've got relationships with the, with the enterprise players, with the PC players. They've got products in every single segment of the market. But I think they're really spread too thin. And I think it's going to be very challenging for them to fund yeah. both Foundry and all the work they have to do in the design. And so I think people see it and they say, okay, great. Hey, they're, they're announcing all this stuff. Pat has his shit together, obviously. They're announcing all these AI products. I also think there's, People want an alternative to NVIDIA, but I tell you, when you talk to people privately, they're like, uh, yeah. Intel, they're really, they're really scuttlebutt their Palo products Alto. are still stinging. They, the, their products are not what they used to be. The scuttlebutt in know. Palo Alto is Silicon Valley is that, oh, dang, that plane might hit that mountain. So like, I mean, I think it is what it is. I, I think their best, and that's the other thing is I put out on, on Twitter, what's the scenario for Intel regaining that lead? And I think the, the, the best scenario, which is awful, is that China takes over TSM, which is pretty high probability. And then what happens? Then people are going to be forced, Apple is going to be forced to start looking for alternatives, but I think they're going to look to Samsung before they look to Intel because you know Samsung's ahead in, 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 in Foundry. But there's still a chance that the US government could get Apple in a headlock and you know get Intel and Apple in a room and say, you know, Tim Cook, give that business to Pat and save the friggin' foundry business, but Intel's still got to deliver, and right now they're not delivering on that front. Well, that's good analysis. We'll pick that up another time. Um, I will just say, I just wanted to get this out there. We were at the SAS event at the RU you mentioned earlier. SAS Explorer, yeah. SAS Explorer, when it was um, the, um, when it got hacked. So I was talking about those guys. They run a golf tournament called SAS Championship, Dave. I was invited going, to play right? in the Pro Am. Oh, awesome. I'll be playing in the Pro Am as a 15 handicap for the SAS Championship. I'm going to go down early and do a little video taping, maybe sideline, kind of inside the ropes, social media, video blogging. Awesome. You and have a 15 handicap? Yeah. 
Then you never freaking golf. That's pretty good. I'm at the top of the curve, though. I'm not exactly Yeah, but average. that's how, how many that's times average. a year do you golf? Once a month, maybe. That's it. 12 Eight. times a year you golf. Well, probably less than that. I know guys golf 12 times in a week. <laughs> I mean, shooting 70, if that's the case. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. It's in North Carolina, Cary, North that's Carolina. Great. It's a senior tour. Fred Couples, Bernard Langer. So, bucket list item, check. I got invited, too, you know. But I'm, I'm away that week doing a show. I'm at UiPath, oh, I and I'm was, a really she, sucky golfer. I wish you were I there. I would never. I would choke. <laughs> well, I wish me luck. <laughs> and uh, thank God it's not on TV. Um, anyway, great great pod 30. That's us, friend. Go to siliconangle.com. That's where all the news is hitting. Rob Hof and team are driving a lot of great stories. Thecube.net. That's the catalog of content for all the events. We've got a lot more events coming up. We've got reInvent at the end of the year. we got... We got um, supercomputing in Denver. That should be a good one. Find out what's going on the chip level. And of course, KubeCon, CNCF, that's Cloud Native Con, Kubernetes. DockerCon, we're not going to be up. I'll do a briefing with the CEO. But it'll be the first time we're not covering DockerCon. It's in the hist I, company's I get history. We wide path in two weeks. We got a Teradata event down in Florida. Okay. Yeah. Just keep in tune to the Cube. We'll be doing our normal thing. Thanks for listening. Episode 30 is in the books.